what we have in church this morning. I don't know about you, but this makes me happy. Hallelujah. And I miss y'all. I miss y'all. Every time I come back, I feel like, oh, I love this place. I absolutely do. Let me tell you something. If you don't feel like you have found a church home, you have found a church home. The truth of God's word is in this place and undefiled. It is not watered down. There's no backup in us here. Hallelujah. There is none, and we need that as the body of Christ. And the Spirit is welcome here to move freely all of the time. And if you don't understand what's going on, that is okay. That's all right. The more you sit in it, the more God will open up your eyes to understand his spirit and why we're hooting and hollering and praying and, and cheering and chanting and all kinds of different things because God is worthy, y'all. He is worthy. Hallelujah. Huh? Why am I so happy? What do you mean? <laughs> My testimony of why I'm so happy. <laughs> Hallelujah. Actually, you know what, Pastor Matt? I don't have to go all the way back, but I, did, I do have a testimony. Um, this week, my husband and I are like Sunday, I mean Saturday, my husband and I found out that we're having a baby girl. Hallelujah. 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 And her, we're naming her Selah. And Selah is out of the book of Psalms. And when you read God's truth, you stop because it says Selah, meaning Praise him for the truth that you just read. Praise him for the truth that you just read. And I was thinking as we were worshiping in this house, I was thinking about how God is birthing, not just in my womb for real, but in the womb of the church, a praise for the truth that we are constantly under. And I want to encourage you this morning, do not be discouraged Okay, say, I will not be discouraged in the trial I find myself in. I am growing in grace. That's right. So y'all don't be discouraged this morning. God has a word. He has a word for you. And the word is this. They multiplied and they grew. Oh, they multiplied and they grew. Sometimes you feel like, man, I am not getting anywhere. I am not seeing it. I don't understand, Lord. God, I don't get it. I'm just, I feel like I'm just hitting a brick wall every day, every day. But God said this in his word, that they multiplied and they grew. I've been coming to this church about four years now around there. Let me tell you something. We have been tilling this ground. We have been. And I have seen, I see so many new faces. I see growth. And people that four years ago, Rob, we didn't look the same. That's right. We didn't look the same. We, we've been growing. <laughs> we've been growing. I'm not talking just in number, even though I see numbers more here. I'm talking about the quality of what God is doing in your life. I'm talking about the peace that you didn't have four years ago. I'm talking about the joy that you didn't have two weeks ago. He wants us to grow in grace, grow in him, grow in faith. Twelve years ago when I first got saved, I'll tell you this. I just wanted to get off heroin. I didn't, I didn't get saved. I, and I can be honest, I didn't get saved because I was like gung-ho to know Jesus. I just wanted to get off heroin. But now, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. I can't live without Jesus. I need to talk to Jesus. I need to read his word. I need to be in his presence. I need him every single day of my life. This is not just something I do. Because my parents told me to go to church. No, this is something that I am. And this is something he wants you to be. He wants us to be. My little girl, McCartney, I, she said, well, we got to go to church because we got to meet Jesus. And I said, yes, baby, that's true. But you know what? We are the church. Yes. And we can meet Jesus right in our home, right here. She's like, you're right. And I was like, yeah, baby, the spirit of God lives in you. He lives in you. That's what they need to know. 
and them babies back there, the enemy is after their souls. He is. Lord, that baby in your womb, the baby in my womb, the enemy is already having an assignment against our children. He already has an assignment against the next generation. And if you would give me a moment, Exodus 1, 8, I'm going to travel fast, Pastor Matt. Buckle up. All right. <laughs> Bible says this, Exodus 1, 8. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. The enemy was saying, hold up, they're growing. Wait up, there are more of them now. <laughs> they're mightier than we are. He said, come, this is the king over Egypt. It's the enemy saying, come, let us deal shrewdly with them unless they multiply. He wants to stop you in your tracks. He wants to stop your children. He wants to stop the multiplication of your children knowing God and you knowing Jesus and those around you knowing him too. And it happened in the event of war. I want to point that out. In the event of of war. You are in a war, child of God. We are in a war of light and darkness, of good and evil. We are in a war of heaven and hell and the enemy trying to overtake God's kingdom. And we know that we win in the end because the word of God says that we win in the end. But the war is to keep believing and to keep going and to see the multiplication in our children and for them to grow generation after generation after generation. And the job of the enemy is to stop that multiplication. So he's saying, come, we got to set out a snare. We got to set out an assignment against them because if I can get them to stop believing, then I can stop the growth of the church church because they're getting mighty they're getting more than we are yes. the enemy is scared of the power of God he is scared of the authority of God because he must bow in the name of Jesus if you know what you got and you actually use it then the enemy's got to go yes. he has to so the job of the enemy is to distort your view of God and what you actually have inside your earthen vessel. God help us. So in the event of war, that they also may join our enemies and fight this good fight against us. So go up out of the land. Therefore, they set up taskmasters over them to what to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh supply cities, Phitom and Ramses. But the more, hallelujah, the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. <laughs> oh, listen to me, <laughs> glory. The more they afflicted them. Hey, if you're afflicted this morning, if you're cast down, if you're overburdened, if you're worried, if you're troubled on every side, he said the more they afflicted them, the more they had the opportunity to multiply and to grow. And they were in dread. The enemy himself was in dread. He was disgusted at the fact that the children of Israel were multiplying and growing. Let me tell you, the enemy is disgusted with the fact that you walked in here this morning and that we prayed over these babies and that you came up and you got what God wants to give you this morning. Listen, all hell is coming against you because you are marked by the Spirit of God. 
You are marked. Those babies are marked by the Spirit of God. He said, no weapon that is fashioned against you shall stand, and that every tongue that rises up against you shall be condemned. This is your inheritance. Yes. Jesus died to give you that inheritance. Yes. Somebody had to die. Yes. And Jesus said, I'll go for them. Spotless lamb of God slain to give you an inheritance. And the Bible also says that children are an inheritance from the Lord. So let me tell you, you lay hold of the altar of God and say, I'm not going to leave. I'm not going to let go. That's my inheritance. And I'm not going to let them go in the spirit. Look, some of us have children that have walked away. I have one right now. My husband and I are fighting tooth and nail for but that's what the word of God said. When they are afflicted, they are going to multiply and they are going to grow. Hallelujah. Yeah. So we see there's three things I want to focus on. One, the condition of the people. There's a reality to the, to the walk with God. The condition of the people were that they were afflicted. Look, y'all don't got to walk around and act like everything is gravy and it's easy and and we got we sprouted wings and we got halos on top and we just floating through this life no we are going through trials we are real people serving a real god with real emotions and real hurts and real pains and real ailments in our bodies and real financial troubles, and real relationship troubles, and we are traveling through this, but Jesus said, my people are afflicted. They're, the enemy wants to make you feel so overburdened yeah. that you quit. Come on. Because, man, it's hot in here, Pastor Matt. Am I just <laughs> pregnant? I am burning up. <laughs> oh my God. Wouldn't be appropriate. <laughs> Jesus. I don't know. I am pregnant, but I don't know. I'm burning. Unless it's just a fire of God coming out. I don't know. <laughs> but the people of God, they were afflicted. They were in this condition. See, the enemy of e the Pharaoh of Egypt were taking God's people captive. The goal of the enemy is to get your mind captive, to get your heart captive. And he'll do it a little bit at a time. And what happened is the children of Israel were taken captive into Egypt. But I love this because they were taken captive, yes, but they were thriving. Egypt represents the world. Egypt represents where we have to live. We have to live here. And there is a war going on between light and darkness in this world. And we have to live here. And at every moment, the enemy is coming in to try to take your mind, your thoughts, your emotions, your heart, your spirit captive to him at every chance he gets. Look, you don't even need to be around anybody. You can wake up in the morning with yourself. And he can, right? And he could start trying to depress you, overwhelm you. You know that soap opera of our life we've been playing on and on and on in our minds, taking us captive every day, telling you God isn't real. God doesn't hear your prayers. Why are you even going to church? Why are you even calling his name? Because he knows that if you call the name of Jesus, Jesus has to move. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word of God. And when our weapons of warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in the pulling down of strongholds, when you open up your mouth and you begin to call on the name of Jesus, the Spirit of God begins to move on your behalf and behalf of your children. So if he can get you captive in your heart and your mind and you don't even open up your mouth, then the enemy can begin to bombard your heart and get you to move further and further and further and further and further away from the truth. And one day you wake up and you don't even know if you believe in the Lord any longer. Or where is he now? But I believe that God has an awakening coming to this church and to the church of the United States of America to tell us that I know that my people are afflicted, but there is a season that they are living in that they are going to multiply and that they are going to grow in me. Yeah, you, Hallelujah. The process, though, is the event of war. Every morning in heavenly armor will enter the land. Uh, the battle belongs to the Lord. You got to get up in the morning ready for 
for war. Yes, you got to get up in the morning ready to push through and believe. Yes. God, I'm going to believe you today despite what it looks like. I'm going to believe you today despite my circumstance. I'm going to believe you today. And the result of them warring is they multiplied and grew. Right before the book of Exodus, which I love the book of Exodus, my favorite book, it means to exit. God has produced through the cross an exit strategy for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But before that is Genesis, which is in the beginning. And Pastor Matt talks about this all the time, that we were born in Adam. Meaning that, that we had, there's a fall that took place in the beginning. And the reason why I want to touch on this is because this is when sin entered into the world. And this is when deception actually took place. The deception of Adam and Eve. What is a deception? The act of causing someone to accept something as true or valid when it is really false or invalid. The job of the enemy is to deceive you at all times. It was in the beginning in the garden of Adam and Eve. His, his character, the character of the enemy is to get you and our children to believe the lie. Yeah. To believe something that is false as though it were truth. As though it were truth. Satan's character is deceive and lie. John 8, says this. You are the, of your father, the devil, that lusts. Let's look at lust. Impulses, the act of being driven by a strong force. Lust, fine. We can look at it in a sexual connotation, fine. But lust is also being, you could be driven by anger. You can be driven by anxiety. You can be driven by fear. You could be driven by grief. You could be driven by hatred. You could be driven by uh, unforgiveness. You can be driven by control. I got to control everything. You can be driven by a lust. And that is a characteristic of the enemy. And he deceives you into believing that this is where you got to stay. God hasn't delivered you from that depression. God hasn't delivered you from that anxiety. Oh, this is a better, just hate on them. Just hate them. Look what they did to you. And he keeps you and drives you and has control over your heart and your mind. Jesus says that that is a characteristic of the enemy. It says, of your father will do. He was a murderer. So the enemy is a murderer. His job is to rob, to kill, and to destroy. It also means manslayer. Murderer means manslayer. He is coming to slay you and to slay our children. From the beginning in the book of Genesis. And he abode, that means he remained, he continued, not in the truth. Because there is no truth in the enemy. When he speaketh, he speaketh a lie. That's all the enemy could speak. All he could speak is false. He speaketh not not of his own, for he is a liar, and he is the father of it. So let me tell you this. The enemy wants to take the word of God, test it, twist it, and use it as a trick. God knows that you love him. God knows that you want to do his will. You wouldn't have walked in here this morning if you didn't love God. You, didn't, you wouldn't have walked in here this morning if you didn't want to do his will. God, the enemy also knows your desire to serve God, and he will take the word of God and use it against you. Just like he did with Eve. Just like he did with Eve. In Genesis 3.1, it says, Now, a continuation of this spiritual warfare, the serpent was more subtle. He is crafty, he is cunning, and he is smooth. You ever make me to like a smooth operator? (laughs) You know, somebody that can talk real smooth and real sly, and then you look up like later on, you walk away from the conversation, and it was like, something wasn't right about that. But it sounded real good. It sounded real good. Well, that's what the enemy, he will do. It says that he was more subtle, he was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, has God said, You shall not eat of the tree of the garden? 
He will take the word of God and say, did God really say that? You know you can get away with a little bit of that. Come on. You know you can go there. You know they did you real wrong. You're justified in the way you've been treating them. He will take the word of God and sprinkle it with a little bit of falsehood and make it look like the truth. Make it look valid. He will validate you. The enemy will validate your feelings. He will, and, and you know what the word of God has said. And if you don't know what the word of God says, let's get in the word of God. Amen. Okay, because sometimes I feel like I'm talking about something. And then you're, I feel like we're not in the word that maybe we should be like in the word. And then we, we're ignorant. That's right. We're ignorant. He said, my people will fail for ignorance. That's right. God, help us to get in your word and actually understand what you're trying to say to us. And he says, God said you shall, has God really said you shall not eat of the tree? And I want to, listen, because he was trying to make Adam and Eve like God. Look at this. Isaiah 14, 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, he's talking to Satan, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. In the sides of the north. Isaiah 14, 14. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. The character of the enemy of Satan was to always be like God. He wanted to be higher than God. He wanted to exalt himself above God. So if God has, ex it has revealed himself in his word to you, and we choose as believers, to not do or go or believe, hey, we real good at picking and choosing what we do and don't want to do. Where we want and who don't want to go. Listen, I'll be honest with you, and I tell Pastor Matt this, and my people know this already. I would not have moved from, Louis from New Jersey to Louisiana and now to Mississippi. I really wouldn't have, y'all. I would have been still in New Jersey. But God had a plan, and he had a purpose. And if I wouldn't have listened to him, one, I wouldn't have met y'all, and I wouldn't have been in this wonderful church, and then I wouldn't have met my husband. And I would, I would, there would, See, God is lining things up for you. He has a strategic plan for you. He has a purpose for you. But we can disregard what God says, and we can end up in the belly of a whale if we want to, Jonah. God, help us to actually abide by your word. Yeah. If you have not forgiven someone and you wonder why you're constantly angry and distressed, it's because you have chosen. He said, you must forgive in order to be forgiven. So in order to be forgiven and to feel free, you must let go of that thing. I know it hurts. I know it's painful. You might have to cry those ugly tears, but cry it out and allow God's spirit to renew you and refresh you because the only person you're keeping captive is yourself. And that's the job of the enemy, to take the word of God and allow you and to get you to pick and choose. Did God really say that? Is he really real? Did he really say he would heal your body? Did he really say he would deliver you? You know that thing's still coming up. You see it, and you've even been struggling with it, and he'll remind you of every mistake that you have made and get you to try to believe that God is not real and that his word is not true. That's the war. That's the event of war. Hallelujah. Genesis 3, 2 said, and the woman un said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. So she was referring back to his word. Yes. She was saying, I know what God said. So she was going to be held accountable for what God had said to her. James says, if we know what to do and we do not do it, it is sin. Mm. And sin separates us from God. Yes, help us, Lord. God, help us to do what you said you were going to do. Listen, and we don't have the power to do what he says. You don't have the power to love the unlovable. 
You don't have the power to tell the truth when you're backed up into a corner and God wants you to tell the truth. We don't have the power to forgive when we were molested as a child or raped or, or we don't have the power to forgive when we grew up in a home that was totally depressive and oppressive. And we don't have the power to allow God to come in and heal a grieving heart when we have lost a loved one. We don't have the power to be able to do those things. We don't have the power to walk away from that lust of sexual immorality or that drink or that drug. We don't have the power to do those things. But God said, he who is in you is greater than he who is in this world and I have given you the power to walk in my authority and the back of sin is broken and the law of the life of the spirit of Christ Jesus you can live there you all either live under one law the law of the sin and death or the law of the spirit of life there's only two (laughs) there's no middle ground you can't stay here One or the other. And God wants you to live in this place, in the spirit of God and what he has for you. And he says, take my word. So she takes his word. But the fruit of the tree was in the midst of the garden. And God has said, you shall not eat of it. Neither shall you touch it lest you what? Die. Wages of sin is death. God is saying to us. Listen, if you do not abide by my word, death comes. And it comes to steal from you and your children. God's word is the exact opposite of what we feel like we should do. How we feel like we should act, how we feel like we should be. But God said, I have made you a new creature, a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And the serpent says unto the women, Pastor Matt, you should not surely die. Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about. When you're about to go do that thing, say that word. Oh, I've found nasty things in my heart between me and my husband. I'll tell you that. Your spouse, I mean, I thought my best friend took it out of me. Y'all didn't know Nia is my best friend. Um, But... There's a, a thing with a spouse <laughs> that they really know how to rub you the wrong way and bring it on up out of you. But God said, <laughs> I will give you power to say, okay, honey, I love you anyway. I will go the extra mile. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Can be in the little things. See, if you allow things to boulder up, even in your relationships with other people, then there's death that comes to that relationship. Even with your children. There's death that can come when we allow things, offenses, to build a fence around us. So now there's a separation between us and that person, and it's the same thing with the Lord. As we allow things to come into our lives that are against his word, it builds a fence, a separation between God and us and between us and others. You shall not surely die, and every time it's producing death. God help us. Satan is producing a a revolution against God. That is his master plan to deceive us. And for us to pick and choose what we will and what we will not abide in. But let me tell you, I remember my, my parents used to say this all the time. I, I'm, I say what I mean and I mean what I say. I say what I mean and I mean what I say. And you let, live in my house, you got to abide by my rules. As long as you live here. And that's what God means to us. He's saying, you chose me, which is right and good. And you now live in the house of God. You are in my kingdom. You are born with my name. You have my DNA. So you live in my house. You abide by my rules. I say what I mean. And I mean what I say. You ever have God say no to you and then you go do it anyway? And you knew that you weren't supposed to do that? (laughs) 
And then you find out later, he, meant, he said what he meant, and he meant what he said. The answer is still no. And now you've got to dust your bruises off. And your back hide is, is a little raw from getting a spanking from the Lord. But thank God he brings us back. Thank God he takes us back in his arms. Genesis 3 says, 3, 5 says, For God does know that in the day that you eat of it, that your eyes shall be open and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. The temptation and the trick is always that God is withholding something from his people. God is withholding something good from you. He won't allow you to do this or go there and do that because he's withholding something good for you. When he knows what is right around the corner can produce death. He is protecting you as a good parent. But sin blinds man and hardens the heart of man. And we are forced by that lust or that desire to want to go into that direction unless we die to it. You have to reckon yourself dead. I am dead. That anger comes up. I am dead to that anger. I am dead to that sorrow. I am dead to that lust. I am dead to that desire. I am unplugged. There is no power that the enemy can have over me and my family any longer. My child is dead to that thing in the name of Jesus. My child is delivered in the name of Jesus. We have to start picking up our authority. But what will happen is the more we fall into that sin, we become blinded and hardened in our heart. Hearts. And that's what was happening here. They went and they ate of the tree, and now sin entered into the world and took captivity captive. And that's where we find ourselves in the book of Exodus with the children of Israel. Pharaoh, as Satan, has come in and now taken humanity captive. When Pastor Matt is always talking about we were born in Adam, meaning we were born into sin because Adam and Eve believed the lie and ate of the tree and discarded the word of God and, they, and had no regard for what God had said, knew what God had said, but disregarded it. Don't become passive, church. Let's not be passive Christians. I heard my pastor say, he said, let's be pursuers, not passive Christians. But God said this, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. He's saying this, even though you can be ruled and reigned and dominated by sin, I have made a way and I have crushed the head of the serpent by the cross of Calvary. In the beginning, they fell and God said, I've made an exit strategy. God said, I have made a way for you. Though that you are afflicted, I have have made a way for you to grow and multiply. Though you find yourself in this condition, falling into this trap, I have made a way. God knew we were going to mess up and blow it. Stop thinking of ourselves as perfect. That's our problem. And that's, that will keep you out the church doors, thinking I should have had it all together. We don't come in here because we have it all together. We come in here because we need God to fix us because we are broken people. We need God to heal us because we have healing that is needed. We need deliverance. Listen, if you see a brother or sister struggling, you better not look over them with a cross eye. You afflicted just like them. You in the same condition. And the same boat. And if you're thinking like that, you, you might be in more trouble than them. Because at least they at the altar. At least they at the altar again and again. Oh, how many times they got to go? They go as many times as they need to go. You better go on up here and put your hands on them and begin praying over them. Because these Israelites found themselves in the same captivity with each other. We are with each other in this walk. See, that's why people leave the church. Because they expect Christians to be perfect. Listen, you don't serve a perfect man. You serve a perfect God. 
Bless us, Pastor Matt. If you see any flaws in me or Pastor Matt or the worship team or whatever, you better say, okay, Lord, I'm just like them. I'm just like them. Me and, me and Pastor Matt just me, might be a little bit more vocal. That's okay because you vocal all up in here. You just don't let it come out of our mouth. But I want to say this. They were together. They were together in their condition. They were together in their affliction. And God said, I have paid a payment by my blood on Calvary that I could redeem humanity. So though the enemy came in with his deceiving lies and his trickery and his snares, and he took the word of God and used it against the child of God, that's the job. Get you to believe a falsehood. Get you to believe something that is false for truth. Though we fell, he said, I have made you an exit strategy. Mm. I have made a way. So So even though we've been seduced into believing a lie, God said, I am going to make you thrive. If you have come in this morning, and you have felt downcast, afflicted, and burdened, if you have felt terrorized by the enemy. Y'all know what I'm talking about in your mind when it's a constant torment? I mean, I'm talking about everywhere you go, it's there. Every time you wake, it's there. Terrorizing, browbeating. They're trying to bring you low and make you quit forcefully. It's like a, it's like a hostile spirit that has come against you and your family. Well, he's saying, look, even though you found yourself in this affliction in the midst of Egypt, I am here to set you free. I am here to set you free. You got to be in the event of war, though, he says. And I like this because when we come into this place in the book of Exodus 1, which means the redemption of man, he says this, Joseph had just passed away. Joseph and his generation had passed away. And when they had passed away, the word of God says the children of Israel were fruitful at this time. I see some fruit in this house. I do, Pastor Matt. I see some fruit in here. I see God moving in here. I see the prayers that we have prayed being answered. I see some fruit. And he said, and they increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceedingly mighty. And the land was filled with them. There was a bunch of believers. There was a bunch of testimonies. There was a bunch of people strong in the spirit. But Joseph's generation was dying off. We have a generation of believers that are older than us that have walked in the truth, that have walked in righteousness, that has set a tone, that have have built a generation of believers, and it is our turn to take up the mantle and to believe God in this next generation and to stand for truth and to stand for righteousness. I mean, you have Jacob, you have Joseph, and all of their generation. If you look in the beginning of Exodus, it lists a ton of names that that walked in the truth of God's word even in the midst of their captivity. But then they all passed on, and it was the next generation's job to take on the gospel message. And when it was the next generation's job, the enemy said, it's our time to get them. Mm. See, that's what's happening right now in this generation. Have y'all even looked at the news? I mean, for Pastor Matt to tell that story about the braces and the, and the cutting of the spinal cord, I mean, to me, that's like, how do people even come up with this stuff? And, and you know what, though? And then I remember what I was like when I was sitting under a bridge with a needle in my arm. I mean, who, 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 somebody might have looked at me and been like, how do you even get to that spot? You know what I mean? And it's because sin dominates humanity without Christ. We need a renewing of the mind every single day. Every day. Look, your mind can become polluted. I mean, just turn on the TV. And you'll need to take like 10 showers. I'm serious. 
My mom and I talk about this all the time. The shows that we like start to watch, two, two shows in, you got all this filth. Two episodes in. You're like, well, not that one. Well, not that one. I might as well just throw this whole darn TV out. Pastor um, David Wilkerson, I remember he wrote a book that said, just get rid of the TV. Because look at the filth coming in to pollute. That's, a, that's how I feel. I'm sorry, I'm going to go on a rant for a second. But that's how I feel about uh, my children. I'll be busting in the door. Like, what y'all watching on TV? My husband laughs at me. I'm like, I'm serious. We are a protector of our home. What are they watching? It's already hard to go to school. A friend of mine told me that they're hiding vapes all in private parts and all kinds of different places just to vape in school. She's a school teacher. Like they got, I mean, our, this next generation is fighting things that we didn't even have to think about. And I ended up in a hard spot in my life. So imagine the war that's being waged against this next generation. And you are the soldiers that are supposed to be locking arms so the enemy can't get to our children. It is our responsibility and our job to wage war. I already pray over my womb all the time. I'm like, Selah, you're going to be a mighty warrior for the kingdom of God. Girl, you're going to be a praiser. God, I pray. I I mean, I do. Because you can't start too early. And you know what? You ain't too late. Don't you dare let the enemy believe. Don't you dare let the enemy believe that because your children are grown and they have their own lives and they married with their own kids or whatever, that it is too late. No, you wage war against the enemy. No, my children shall follow after the Lord. My house shall follow. He said a whole house home. He didn't tell Rahab, just go get a kid's. Get the whole household. Anybody that will come in by the blood of the lamb. Anybody. Cousins. Step step kids. Third generation. Fourth generation. No, grandmama's grandmama, grandmama, grandma. All them. They all welcome. You got your household in the kingdom of God. And he said, when the affliction came upon the people. Look, you might have, you might see with your eyes the condition and the affliction. But he said, they multiplied and that they grew. They increased abundantly. That means there was a large amount of quantity. God ain't in the sprinkling business, y'all. You know how, oh God, please help me. (laughs) You know how when you go to a Catholic baptism and they sprinkle the water, God wants to immerse you. In his glory. He wants to immerse you in his peace. He wants to immerse you in his presence. He wants to immerse you in deliverance. He wants to. And then you say, well, why am I not delivered yet? Because God said, if I would have delivered you that way, it would have consumed you. In the book of Deuteronomy, he says that. He said the nations are many. Your problems and your struggles are many. But I will deliver you, but I can't do it all at once. Because if I did it all at once, it would consume you. And I want you, and it says in Deuteronomy, I want my people to learn how to war. Hallelujah. Hey, I don't know about you, but I, I and I know some people that are real good fighters. Like, I'm not talking about UFC fighting or anything like that. I'm talking about with this. And I was one that could use my words wickedly and fight. And I probably, God help me, still do. God, yeah, help us. Don't act like y'all are strong and mighty. (laughs) But God wants to take that and change that about me. Change that about us. But he's he's not not saying, I want you to go and, and, 
and wrestle it out and fight it out in your own strength. I don't need you to talk it out. I don't need you to tear people down. I don't need you. I don't. I need you to fight in your spirit. Yeah. I need you to fight on your knees. I need you to fight with your sword. You don't go to battle and let you pick up your sword. And the word of God is your sword that will cut down every lie and tactic of the enemy. You've got to learn what the heavenly armor is and what you need to put on every day. The Bible says put on the whole armor of God that you're able to stand against the wiles and the trickery and the deception of the enemy. I'm going to go to this real quick. He says, finally, brethren, be strong, meaning empowered in constant faith. Constant faith. I'm a personal trainer. I tell my people, if you aren't constant, you ain't going to lose no weight. If you ain't consistent, you ain't going to see no results. And it can't just be when you come see me one hour a week. It's got to be 24-7, seven days a week. And you know what? We see some people with results, and I see some people that don't. And the people that don't show me they were inconsistent. And I still love them, and I still try to help them. But it's the same thing with our walk with the Lord. He is saying to be strong, we need to be in constant faith, in constant belief, in constant battle. And if we aren't, we are going to see the results of that in our life. We're going to see the results of that in our life. And it says, in the Lord and the power of his might. The power of God is at your disposal. Did you know that? I mean, think about that. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the God who created in heaven and earth, who hung the stars, who knows their name, who causes kingdoms to stand and kingdoms to come down. He lives in you. And his power is at your disposal all of the time. And he says this, but put on, put on. Oh, I got a responsibility. Oh, we don't like that. Mm -mm, We want it all to come easy. He said, put on. As a child of God, you have an obligation to wage war. The whole armor of God. If you don't put on one part of the armor, one part of your body is going to be exposed. So all of a sudden, you're all covered up, but your foot is out and your foot gets blown off. And you wonder why. You wonder why that area is under attack. Maybe we didn't put on the whole armor of God. Maybe we missed a beat. It says, put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to what? Stand against the tactics, the tricks, the lies of the devil. For we wrestle, we contend, we struggle. Not against flesh and blood, but principalities, powers of darkness, and wicked rulers of the air. Darkness, demonic forces are working together to destroy you. Get it? It's true. The Bible says it's true. So when the enemy has come to afflict you, the Bible says... That there was an event of war. But God wants us to be able to continue to believe in the event of war. And he says this, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. Today is that day. Today is that day. If you look around us, it is an evil day. And it says, Having done all to stand. All to stand means you did not give one inch to the enemy. Don't allow one step to be taken from you. Don't give him one inch. As soon as he, you recognize that's not God. That's the enemy. You cast down vain ima- imaginations. Taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. He said stand Remain, continue. Therefore, having girded your loins in truth, 
in the truth of God's word, having the breastplate cover your heart of righteousness. I am righteous because of the blood of the lamb. I am righteous because he says that I am. I am righteous because he died on Calvary. I don't have to settle for less. I don't have to walk in condemnation. I am righteous. You put on the breastplate of righteousness. You shod your feet in the preparation of the gospel of peace. Wherever you go, you can bring the peace of God with you. Wherever you go, you can shed the light of Christ with you. You walk in peace because he has given you peace. Take up the shield of faith. So to quench every fiery dart of the enemy, you have to have a shield of faith. I'm talking about the event of war that you are in and what your obligation as a child of God is. I know it's taking a little long, and I'm sorry if you're hungry or tired, but I want to tell you this. That this is something that you need every single day of your life. You are, you have been born into this world where Satan, Pharaoh, has come to take you and your children captive. And you are in an event of war. And we, as children of God, need to know what we need to do to walk this thing out. Said it will quench this shield. Faith will quench every fiery dart of the wicked one. And take on the helmet of salvation. Protect your mind. Protect, look, that mind is wicked. It will take you down the street and back again. And all the way to next year. And back to 12 years ago and back again. I mean, I don't even know what y'all thought about the whole time you were sitting there, but we could have been all over the road. But he says, protect your mind with the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. Wait, praying always. Prayer warriors, step up. I don't know how to pray. You know, the disciples went to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us to pray. They weren't ashamed. You can ask the Lord, teach me to pray. I don't pray like Pastor Matt. You don't need to. God wants to hear your voice. I don't pray. See, he gives each one of us a gift. I don't, pray. I don't pray like Pam. I don't pray like Nia. I don't sing like Nia. I don't sing like Nia neither. But you're going to hear me sing. And if you don't like it, sorry. I'm praising my God anyway. I'm praising my God anyway. He said, he said praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. And watching thereunto with all, watching, watching. That's why I kicked the door. That's why I'm like, what y'all watching on TV? What y'all got going on? What's on that phone? What we, I'm watching. I'm watching. I'm watching for me. I'm watching for mine. I'm watching for my husband. He's watching for me. He's watching for them. We watching together. Yes. Ain't an enemy not going to have no foothold in my home. And we're going to be watchful. And now, that's not to say that he won't sneak his little dirty hands in either. He knows how to get them. But I'm going to be watching. I'm going to be watching. It says watching thereunto with all. And you can be watchful for your friends too. The Bible says be your brother's keeper. Oh, you better believe when I don't hear from Nia. Where you at? What you doing? It's never anything wrong, but come on, we can fall, fall into a slump. Where you at? What's going on? Be, watch. Watch for your own soul. Watch for those around you. I text Pastor Matt out of the book, pray for y'all. Don't know what's going on. I text Pam the other day. She said, that was God. That was God. Praying for you, thinking of you, love you. I'm here watching, watching, because we're, we're together. We're in this together. And he says, with all what? Perseverance. That means you're diligent, you're consistent, you're constant with supplication of the saints. He said, now look, Exodus 1.8, now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. The enemy has no regard for God, his word, the kingdom of God, 
the glory of God. He wants to destroy it at all costs. And he says, the Bible says, and he said to the people, look, the children of Israel are more and mightier than us. He's seen the growth of the people. As soon as you begin to move in the direction that God is calling you to move, as soon as you begin to pick up your authority, as soon as you begin to put on the whole arm of God, as soon as you begin to believe him for that thing you, you've been struggling with, as soon as you've come to the altar and laid it all down, as soon as that happens, you better be ready because the enemy sees it. He sees it. He sees it. And he says, you know what? Uh-oh. I'm in trouble. They're getting strong and mighty now. They just went down to the altar and got a double portion. And I better go get them before they believe it's true. I better go get them before they believe. Before they actually think they got something from God, I better go take it away from them. And get them to believe the lie. And he, they said, that he said, look, the people of children of Israel are more and mightier than, we, than us. The enemy just seeks to destroy you from moving in the direction that God has for you. He'll try to pick off your soul, dragging you one soul at a time back into bondage. Back into bondage. So he says, come, I will deal shrewdly with them. Shrewdly means I got a strategic plan for them. God has a plan for you. The enemy has a plan for you. And they're both strategic plans. And he says, I will deal shrewdly with them, meaning that I have a contract. And when he, I like this, when he said come, he was calling all demonic forces. All demonic forces. He was saying, come, we got to go. I got a contract against their life, against their family, against their soul. Come. And he said, lest they multiply, and it happen, and lest they keep growing, I got to stop the growth process. I got to stop them from getting it. I got to stop them from knowing the truth. I got to stop them. Come on, all demonic forces, let's go out against them strategically. And the strategic plan against Shelby isn't the one against me. They all different. The enemy been watching you since birth, too. He knows, he knows exactly what to do with you and exactly how to get us. But God, but the, and the enemy says, I can't get them to grow in the event of war that they also may join the enemies and fight against us. He wants to stop the fight of faith. The enemy wants to steal your faith. He wants to stop you from the fight of faith. But I want to show you three people real quick. In the event and the process of war, the people that stood. Remember, they were afflicted, they were in a war, and the result is they grew. Moses, Pharaoh, orders all baby boys to be killed. Affliction. All baby boys to be killed. Mama, event of war. I'm going to take my child and I'm going to put him in the Nile River and he's going to be safe. I don't know what it is, but God is telling, I don't think she would have put her baby in the Nile River if it wasn't for God saying it to her. So she takes her baby and wraps him up and put him in the Nile River and here comes Pharaoh's daughter. Pharaoh's daughter scoops up Moses, the event of war. You know mama was over there on the bank praying, praying for her baby. Oh God, I don't want the enemy to get my baby. So then Pharaoh's daughter takes the baby and guess what? She ends up being the one to take care of that child. The mama was the nurse of Pharaoh's daughter. So the mama that put the baby in the Nile River to protect him is the nurse of Pharaoh's daughter. Pharaoh's daughter takes her and says, go get my nurse. I need her to nurse him. Hey, it's her own baby. <laughs> And then God allows the child to grow up in the kingdom of Egypt to be the one to deliver the Israelites out of Egypt. So we see the affliction, we see the event of war, and we see the results. They multiplied and they grew. And then we see Job. Have you tried my servant Job? Job loses his house. He loses his kids. 
He loses his livestock. He loses his health. He's afflicted, y'all. Look, I don't even know if most of us would have been able to stand that. And his friends go over and say, what did you do? You must have sinned. Good old friends, huh? You must have done something to deserve this. Even his wife says, curse God and die. Y'all better be careful who you marry. God help us. I don't know. My husband turned over and said, curse God and die. I'm like, you know what? I got to go. I'm out. <laughs> you sit with that. But me and my God, we going this way. I don't need to hear that right now. I got boils all over my body. I lost everything I had. I'm not cursing God. He's all I got right now. Yeah. Yeah. That was the event of war. I mean, they, he was afflicted. There's life that happens. God allowed it. Satan went to him and said, I want that one. And God allowed it. Why? The event of war, the testing of faith. And then, wait, uh, the result was after Job believed, he got back a hundredfold what he had already lost. Because he was in the event of war. He believed, he multiplied, he grew. Esther, taken from her orphan home, a heathen land, was chosen to be queen by King Xerxes. The hand of God was upon her. The enemy had an assignment against her and her people. Haman came in and said, we got to kill all these Israelites. We got to kill these Israelites. So she's in there in the, in the palace, in a heathen palace, as a... As a a godly young woman, and she don't know what to do. That's an affliction, y'all. She was taken from her land and put in a, in a position, but she trusted her God in an event of war. And then Haman came after her people, and she was positioned in the palace just for that time. Yes. Just for that time. Just for that time. You are positioned in your household just for that time. You're positioned in your job just for that time. You are positioned in this church just for this time. You don't think it matters right now. You might not understand it, but you are being positioned by God for such a time as this. And she was able to go before her king and said, give me up. Give me up to half the kingdom. Lord, I need you. I need. And he held out the scepter and he said, I will give you what you need yeah. and he saved the Israelites listen there is a result of multiplying and growing in the event of war when you are afflicted and cast down it is your season to rise up and to wage war against the enemy it is not a season to be quiet it is not a season to put down your sword the word of god it is not a season to quit is it a season to persevere and keep coming and keep believing to wage war and he said they're not down yet therefore set up taskmasters i'm ready to tax them out until they faint that's what that meant. Tax masters meant, I am going to tax them out until they faint, until they quit. He says, oh, task masters over them to afflict them, to defile them, to weaken them, to beat them down with their burdens. Make them so heavy, overloaded, oppressed, and worrisome that they want to quit. But the Bible says, but the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were in dread because of the children of Israel. The enemy is in dread every time you open up your mouth 
and say the name of Jesus. Every single time you walk in these church doors and you come in with expectancy, every single time you weren't walking a prayer and you come go in like a kitten and come out a mighty lion, every single time you lift up the name of Jesus to your children, the enemy is in dread. Every time you go to work and you start talking about Jesus on the job, the enemy is in dread. He wants to shut your mouth. Every single time you get a new righteous friend that you start running with, the enemy is in dread because there's more in numbers. There's more in numbers. See, he accuses the brethren because he wants to separate us. He'll start talking to you about her over there, and y'all never even had a conversation before. Oh, she looked at me crooked. He's a liar. You are a mighty army of God, and he has come to make you afflicted and worrisome and trouble and tax you until you faint. And he said, get in the event of war and engage in the process. Have faith in me. Have faith in my word, and I will cause you to multiply and grow. Naya, if you will call, come up, please. I will cause you to multiply and grow. I don't know. I don't know what you came in with this morning. But if you have something that you want God to do for you, you need something in your family to multiply and grow. Maybe you've been weary. Maybe you've been taxed. Maybe you have felt like fainting lately. But God is saying today is your day. In the midst of your affliction, I want to cause you to multiply and grow. He's saying, come, let me show you my results. Come, let me show you my results. Because the result of God is always that there will be growth and a multiplication of his spirit. I'm talking about in you first. When it was, when we, if y'all would stand with me, when we were driving here and it was raining the way it was, a lot of people went and even came to church. I'm so proud of y'all today. But I really prayed. I said, God, the same way it's downpouring out here, let it downpour in here. God, let it downpour in here. God, so I pray this morning that If you need a fresh outpouring of his spirit this morning, you need him to just touch your heart that you come to the altar. He he said in the midst of their affliction, they waged war. If you walk out of here in your affliction and don't wage war, don't come, don't go after what God has for you. It's only our fault because we have to put on the whole armor of God. So God said, let me cause you to multiply and grow, but I need you to come. So you're invited to the altar to come, that we'd pray together, and we get an outpouring of his spirit this morning. Hallelujah, Jesus.